The last bit is uh, we have a, um, a panel and it's going to be an open discussion, so if the panel would like to come up. Um, and I should say as well, there's been a couple of changes to the panel. So Armand is uh, replacing uh, 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 Michelle Van Herp. Um, and Susan Eldon from DFID is replacing uh, Jay Soka Moses from Liberia, um, who didn't get a uh, um, visa to get here. Uh, something else that makes me ashamed to be British, but um, today. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, first off, uh, so the questions that we're supposed to be addressing is just about the biggest one that uh, we, can, we can, I think. So it's, uh, are we doomed to repeat? What do we need to know before the next Ebola outbreak? Um, I mean, I think we can be pretty sure that Ebola outbreaks will occur again. Um, you know, it's in the reservoir. It's, we haven't got rid of it. So, um, and I think we can also be pretty sure that MSF will be right in the middle of whatever. <laughs> whenever it does happen again. Um, I think, so we, the our speakers, are, are, oh, our panel are just going to say a, a few words, a couple of minutes each, um, and, um, uh, and then we'll have a, a general discussion up to 5.15 when Vazi has to go. So first up, <laughs> Michaela, who's um, from um, MSF in, uh, in Geneva. So thank you very much. Um, so the question is, um, or at least uh, what we are going to, to, to cover in this coming uh, time, is what do we need to know before the next Ebola outbreak? So I would like to share with you an experience, or at least my own experience with Ebola. Uh, I was a medical doctor in 2016 in Uganda, in Mundibuyu, when, uh, when the outbreak was, um, was happening over there, small outbreak compared to this one. But at that time, and as medical doctor specifically assigned to the isolation treatment centers, um, the, the main difficulty was really to try to establish relationship with the patient. So I remember my first patient was a suspect case. It was a girl of seven years old. So she came, I was already inside when she came in. So I tried my best to try con to, 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 to establish contact with her. Obviously, with the Googles and all the humidity and foggy of the Googles, she couldn't see that I was trying to make eye contact with her. When I was trying to bring her words of comfort, or at least a dialogue, obviously my voice was completely distortioned by the mask. So even though I was extremely close to her, she felt extremely distant to, uh, to, to manage to establish any kind of relationship with her. When she went out, she was finally not an Ebola patient. When she went out, she really didn't recognize us. She, we were there every day, two or three times uh, a day, inside trying to look after her. And specifically because she was the only child, so we paid quite a lot of attention to her. And, uh, and she went out and really out of the clinic. She was completely, I mean, all the family was extremely happy. But truly, she couldn't differentiate whether we were in or not, whether we have been caring about her or not. Now, the last time I was in 2015, so this big outbreak, uh, I went, but this time as, as medical director, uh, to a field visit in our center in uh, Princess of Wealth in Sierra Leone. And since the moment I stepped in the isolation center, I could realize that the dynamic had completely changed. And at that point, the health staff asked me uh, if I wanted to do a small round with them. So the first thing I obviously I started to think is, OK, I need to prepare myself to put the suit. So it's 15 minutes. Have that been changing? Uh, how is it now the procedure? Is it the Google first? Is it the mask afterwards? Uh, so I was thinking on that. And suddenly I realized that I was already in one of the corridors of the new setup of this, uh, of this Prince of Wales uh, isolation center. And suddenly I had the, the patient in front of us. So the suspect area was done in such a way that before entering to the suspect area, you could, through a corridor, communicate with the patient without the suit. So that changed completely, and I could see it, even though it was not under my responsibility, I was not the patient at that time, that the relationship with the health staff and uh, the patient was completely different. So you could ask questions to them without your suit, doing the eye contact, even though the distance between the patient and the doctor was much longer than the one when you are inside the isolation center. 
And then once you come on inside the isolation center, the patient recognizes you. So the relationship is done in such a way that you can see each other. And once you are in, independently of the foggy goggles, independently of the mask, you can see them, they can recognize you. So it changed completely the dynamic. The same when you go into the isolation in the confirm, in the confirm uh, tent. Uh, the structure was done in such a way that the tent was divided through a corridor where you could see your patients that were the, the ones that were the sickest one in intensive care through a corridor that had glasses. So you were protected, you didn't need your protection suit, and you could really take care of the patient through a distance, through a, a, a glass, but see them much more than just one, twice, or thrice. That is the time that you get for, uh, uh, every day to, to go inside. And the patients really uh, do recognize who is behind their care. And that made a whole of a difference. So in this case, we're not speaking about science. We're speaking really about understanding uh, the contents, understanding the suffering not only of the patient, but of the family. While the previous Ebola treatment center was quite close and it was not transparent to the community, this one was completely open with the barriers that you need not to overpass certain limits. But we, people could see what we were doing inside. And that brought a lot of... Um, uh, transparency into the matter and, and made uh, the community much more aware of what was happening inside. The health staff much more aware of the relationship that you have to have with those patients and the suffering of the patients while inside the isolation and the loneliness that they felt was improved just because the setup was different. So in this case, it's not science, but it's really that human touch that we as MSF and by being closer to the patient managed to put in place that made quite of a difference. So that's what I wanted to transmit to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michaela. <laughs> Uh, so Susan, who's um, well from Diffid and has spent a significant amount of time in the last few months in uh, in Sierra Leone, but uh, Susan. Yes, and first of all, um, apologies for those of you expecting the Minister of Health from Liberia, so I can't uh, claim to be anywhere near that, that level of standing. I was in Sierra Leone um, working as a health advisor for DFID, um, and I guess it's first of all to say I have an enormous amount of respect for those of you in this room who have served on the um, both the Sierra Leone, the Liberia, and the Guinea epidemic. Um, it was pretty humbling to be part of that and observe that. So my thanks to all of you here. Um, it, the question about whether or not we were we are doomed to repeat, and I think there's a pretty broad and widespread consensus. And, and for those of us out there, it does look that emergence is something um, that we need to start the preparations and planning for. Also, historically, I think out of the six countries where it has first emerged, um, it has also re-emerged within five years in four of those countries. So uh, the key thing really is that we start the planning process now and that we think about how we can limit the impact and the spread, how we can work better and faster. <laughs> so a lot of those lessons are, are really right here in this room. So I hope a lot of this knowledge can be distilled. Um, the, the second part of the question was really, what do we need to know? Um, and I, I think Michaela said it so, so very good about a lot of um, how we care for patients and um, how we're able to look people in the eyes through goggles. But those things may not be um, hard science, but they're very, very important. Um, what we're trying to do within DFID and in my organization is we're trying to develop new tools and technologies. We're also trying to develop better behavioral sciences, um, things like the anthropology. Um, there's, there was also one of the speakers was talking about um, you know, the urbanization and, and how it, where it can hide in these slum areas, how we work in these really difficult new environments. Um, but also we, we want to know how the virus behaves and the changing nature of the, the behavior of the virus. Um, probably a personal thing for me is I want to know how we can better protect workers um, and those people in the front lines. Um, at the time I was um, last looking at the statistics, there were about 300 um, health worker infections and, and deaths <laughs> in Sierra Leone. And that's um, pretty tragic given the, the small scale of workers that you have. So for me, that's a sort of 
of particular and personal maybe interest of, of what we'll need to do in the future. Regardless of what we need to do knowledge-wise, I think, again, the aim of that should be about having a better and faster operation, um, also to reduce the mortality, um, which seems to be going the right direction, but also, importantly, to better protect those frontline workers and startup health services. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next up, we have Fazi, who's been very involved in the uh, <coughs> vaccine development at WHO. So. Thank you. And, and first of all, I just have to congratulate MSF, as I'm here at, at an MSF event on their, their fantastic work in this area. So I work, as, as John said, in the, the product development team. I focus on vaccine development at WHO, and I'd just like to um, uh, highlight just a couple of points that WHO, uh, with the international community, are working on in vaccine development. So firstly, this is a sideline in the context of, of the current Ebola outbreak, but it could be really very important for this question, preparing for the future, and that's the vaccine development. So in where we were faced in August with a situation that we had absolutely no information about Ebola vaccines, and so the priority was to accelerate the development and testing, licensure, and use of Ebola vaccines from the vaccine development perspective. And what's happened is a completely unprecedented, I mean, this is a word that's overused, but it's totally unprecedented, parallel um, set of activities related to development, testing, and planning already for licensure and use. We have seen 12 clinical trials that went from the idea to initiation, completion of enrollment, and many of those have reported, many of those have already been published. Um, in the 20 years that I've been working in this, this is far, far in excess of anything that's ever been done uh, in vaccine development for, for any disease. So let, let's just acknowledge this is clearly too late for this outbreak, but for the question is preparing for the next outbreak, that there, there is going to be a next outbreak. I think that the first point is we need to finish the job of licensing and making these vaccines available. As somebody who's been working in much more difficult um, areas in terms of technical feasibility for vaccine development, it's really striking for me that the technical barrier to developing Ebola vaccines is not that high. I, I'm pretty confident that we will be able to license Ebola vaccines in, in the next time period, probably in the shortest time period from the first subject being vaccinated to, to that licensure. We need to see, we need to finish that job. But there's also a separate um, piece of work related to the framework that we need to set up to take the lessons that have been learned from, from what's happened in the last six months and translate that into a, a list of emerging of, of, sort of either pathogens or classes of pathogens that represent um, very likely future public health emergencies, what can be done in the inter-emergency period to invest in vaccine development, drug development, diagnostics development. There's a whole set of activities that could be done. I don't think industry are the bad guys in this, in this situation. This is a framework that needs to be set up and investment can be put in ahead of time. And the last point I'd like to make, um, I mean, there's a lot more that we could discuss in this area, that is that everything that's come out of these clinical trials, uh, much of that has much broad relevance than Ebola. I mean, beyond filoviruses, um, these are platforms which the, the information that is, is emerging is of relevance to um, malaria, HIV, TB vaccine development. Those areas have received billions of dollars of investment for vaccine development appropriately because of the public health issues there. Um, and here, much can be translated to those other areas. Um, and I mean, just speaking personally, I think my personal sort of experience here is that I spent three years living in the Gambia um, l working on malaria vaccine development. So I think it's important that we really maximize the, the information that's been generated. Another whole other issue, if John will let me in, in 10 seconds, is the whole issue of, of data and result sharing in the context of emergencies and how we can improve on this. I think there's a whole, there's a whole series of, of activities that are needed there. And there's a whole series of activities that are underway at WHO now um, and already underway related to, for example, target product profile development to provide forward-looking guidance to, to put all these measures in place before the next outbreak, not only of Ebola, but, but other um, public health emergencies. Thank you. And finally, Armand, to uh, so, <clears throat> yeah. So I have, I have a laundry list of things that we could talk about, uh, but in two minutes, I'm going to have to put them aside. <clears throat> we could talk about how to engage the populations, uh, but Umberto has touched on that, and I think we can 
say that he's going to do better. He's done better with that than I will quickly. We should talk about how to deal with mobile populations that move around faster than we can keep up with them. We could talk about how to improve our delivery of care. Uh, and we could talk about how to capitalize on what we've learned and how to have, be ready for next time. But uh, I'd like to address something that I do advisedly in this room. Uh, we need to solve the problem of doctors and epidemiologists. <laughs> we have yet again been in the field, gone through a number of coordination meetings where the well-intentioned person at the head of the table wearing the official hat engages us in a discussion of what has happened to the three motorcycles that were ordered last week and where they are. And then we move on to the discussion of the per diem, which has not yet been authorized and might get paid next week. Uh, we need to learn how to coordinate a diverse range of partners with variable amounts of experience in Ebola outbreak activities. Uh, the people who are in charge of supervising these activities need to know how to set good objectives for what they need to be, needs to be done, mobilize the appropriate resources to do that, and monitor their way of progressing and achieving those objectives. And I know that when I was in medical school, this sort of thing was not taught. Uh, nor when I did my public health training or my epidemiology fellowship was any of this stuff taught. We have a naive assumption that the people who should be running public health interventions are always doctors or epidemiologists or nurses. But management and coordination is a skill set. These things are learned. Some people are better at these than others. And the system that we have in place does not, it's not a meritocracy. We do not pick the most appropriate person to be sitting at the front of the table. And as I'm sitting next to somebody from WHO, I will say that this is not our problem alone. Um, <laughs> and if we cannot learn how to manage an outbreak of this scale and this complexity effectively, uh, I think we risk repeating a number of the problems that we ran into. So I'd be happy to talk at length about any of the other things that we could have talked about, but I thought I'd get that one out there, because it's not something that we, uh, we bring up often enough, perhaps. And I have plenty of anecdotes if people want to cringe. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much. So that's the opening gambit. Um, and now it's over to you. So um, who would like to ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name's Rob. I'm one of the. I'm a public health trainee. Um, I guess from a public health perspective, wouldn't the best, simplest, and also most difficult way of preventing another outbreak be to improve the capacity of the health protection systems in the countries where the outbreaks might occur, so that actually cases are identified early, and then actions are taken to prevent spread. So uh, a little while back, uh, when we were talking about how we were going to prepare for the next outbreak, I, I mentioned to somebody, the issue of better surveillance will be brought up yet again. We say this after every outbreak. You know, we came late. If we detected it earlier, we would have been able to respond earlier. And, and I'm not against surveillance. Um, but if we had detected this outbreak a month or two earlier, we could have arrived in Gekidu and failed to control the outbreak that much sooner. <laughs> The problem was not that we were necessarily late, is that when we got there, we were ineffective. Uh, we did not engage the community as a partner in outbreak control. We went in with the same messages we'd used before. Uh, unfortunately, we failed to uh, employ lessons that we'd learned in the past. And I don't know that we've ever figured out the best way to engage communities, although we're getting better at it. But we certainly did not get them on board. Uh, cases hid, contacts were very difficult to follow. Uh, and we didn't go in with enough people to get things under control. And surveillance would not have improved that. Um, I, I still think, we, yes, we should detect these things sooner. But the problem is, what do you do after you've detected the outbreak? How do you get in there and get it under control quickly? The gentleman down here so first, and then up there. Bert, Bertie Squire from School of Tropical Medicine, Liverpool. Uh, one of the things that struck me a lot all through today is the issue of the need for person time. I've tweeted about this, but actually none of you have mentioned this. The, the human resource that is going to be required to respond isn't sitting ready. It has to come from somewhere else. So there's, a, there's something that we need to discuss, which is about 
how we get sufficient human resource across all of the disciplines, all of the skill sets that you've mentioned. Management is clearly, management administration coordination is clearly one of them, but the whole business of interacting with patients, interacting with communities needs numbers of people who are able to do this and mobilize this. And it's not just a question of the international community, it's also about local communities. I think that hasn't had enough attention. I don't know what the panel thinks. Michaela, would you like to say that? And probably you are right. I think that uh, in our case, we managed to engage, uh, I mean, we have plenty of national staff working with us, and we had a fantastic response from, the, from, from all the international staff that we had. But, uh, but it's true. It's, I mean, the workforce was the one the workforce was the one limitation that we had whenever we were asking for hands-on activities. So it's something that for sure needs to be well prepared in advance. I think that we engaged quite a lot in trainings that is something that MSF was not used to. So we were uh, aware of, those, of that need and we were aware that to have someone ready, hands-on, to be able to treat patients was going to take us quite a long time. So we decided to invest in treatment and I think that that had a good result, probably late, but had a good result. And I think that is something that we should uh, take as an example for the next one. Susan, do you want to just add? Maybe just a couple of practical examples that I can give from that. Um, on the first question about surveillance, one of the things we found really effective was community-based surveillance, so people from those local communities that actually knew where things were happening. Um, and that is an area where you can really mobilize local resources, and that was seen to be very effective. Um, the other thing is, I think, is to recognize the downside. Um, none of the teachers were working at the time, and so they were you know, massively employed, and all the TBAs, the traditional birth, so they were all brought out in mass to work in the Ebola response, and there was a massive backlash at that time about what happens about all of those other services. So it wasn't simply straightforward to just bring in massive amounts of local people into Ebola. And so there's something about... That's my point, yeah. that you're, you're stealing from somewhere else. Sure. There's a whole... Yeah. There's a whole dynamic mm -hmm. that, that has to be addressed in that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the gentleman at the back with a... Bruce Reeder, MSF Swiss in Canada. Two questions, if I could, both on a sociological anthropological dimension. Um, what uh, should be uh, the future uh, in terms of changing traditional practices, uh, for example, around bushmeat, uh, exposure, uh, traditional burials? Uh, what is the role of uh, the local community and, and the international community in such potential social change? And uh, based on what Umberto had mentioned, uh, to what degree can we incorporate uh, anthropologists, sociologists in the early response team? <laughs> and are they quick in response, or does it take weeks to do such assessments to help field teams? It's <laughs> 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 a very good point. But, uh, yeah. We learned the lesson about the need for anthropologists a long time ago. And anthropologists have been part of our outbreak response for at least 10 years now. Uh, yeah, at least 10 years now. Um, there are a couple of tricks there, though. Uh, one is finding the right anthropologists and finding a way to make use of what they say. Sometimes we get very great ethnographic analyses that explain the root causes of the problem, and it goes back hundreds of years, and uh, you, know, you can blame colonialism and, and you know, uh, problems between the capital. But then you say, well, yes, but what do I do all of that operationally? How do I change my actions or engage in some activity that makes use of what you've done? And that's a little bit trickier, uh, and we've had a bit less luck with that. Um, I don't know that we often try to change what they do as accommodate some of the things that can't be changed and leave it to them to change the things that they can change. Uh, these people, they're not stupid. Uh, they understand what's going on after you give them some time and you engage in a dialogue with them. And often they will, if you explain the risks in terms that, that, that work, often they can fig propose ways that will be the least burdensome change to what they do that is acceptable within their community. And we often find compromises where we get the opportunity and time to engage in that dialogue with them. So we have had some successes there. Uh, unfortunately, we're often overmatched in these outbreaks and we focus on the things that we do well. We, you know, we, we build fortress management center and take care of the patients and have a very patient-centered approach. And, we figure we'll get to that anthropologic stuff when we have the time, um, because we're short on staff and what have you. Uh, so uh, I think we need to 
<coughs> push that as a priority earlier and figure out how to engage with the anthropologist in a way that is operationalizable, if that's a verb that I just made uh, up right now. I'm not sure it is, but I've got to drift, change around. Um, yeah, I've got a question, I think, um, for John and probably for Susan as well. Um, so we, we heard from our keynote speaker about the importance of an early response. Um, and he also showed the picture of the academic uh, timeline for getting proposals out there and maybe funding of project proposals. Just from the two of you, maybe, uh, how can we overcome some of those barriers for next time? Okay, I think that's a tricky one. Um, I, I, happen to, I mean, at the moment, of course, so we, you get a, a real epidemic that goes up and comes down, and then you get a research epidemic that goes up and comes down, and they're offset by some considerable period of time. So at the moment, we're in this rather unseemly scramble for the last few cases, and it's really, uh, you know, um, and, um, and quite political. Um, and uh, so we have to move that. Uh, so it's not. I don't think it's that, it's up to me. I think it's up to the to a, a number of other things. Um, the the funders who need to be much quicker off the mark. There are certain things you can do up front. So you can plan certain trials. For instance, that there should be or, or plan certain studies. For it, but but you only really get to that stage having properly analysed the, the the data that's come out of say this epidemic. And I don't think I can see that happening now, that, 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 this, that, that the data that's available will fizzle away and we'll lose that opportunity to analyze it properly and then line up the potential things that, that should be done rapidly in the event of a, uh, another outbreak. Uh, Isa was talking about different anti-malarial treatments. You know, there's an obvious clinical trial that could be done there, if, uh, you know, um, uh, and why not plan that right now? Um, you know, do the analysis of the observational data we have, and then clean, and then plan that right now. Um, uh, you know, there's no reason not to. Uh, well, John mentioned that the, the funding needs to be there, so that's where I come in. <laughs> um, so we were the you know one of the key donors at that time, and. Um, what we can't do is address the, the sort of stuff and the staff and, and a lot of those things. But on the funding side, I think one of the most important lessons was having flexible funding early on. Um, so trying to have a, a small pool of resources that we could then mobilize for people who could say, actually, I'm trialing this with a community, or actually, I've set up a little bit of a, a an isolation facility. I, I can do a borehole here. I can do this and that. So can we make that funding flexible and fast to those people already on the ground doing that. And I think our ability to mobilize that quicker and to seed out that innovation was was probably key. Um, the frustration came with, with not being able to do that fast enough and at scale um, because it did take us longer than we wanted to. The other frustration was not being able to get the actual massive logistics of stuff, sheer amount of stuff and staff that need to come in. OK, quick Thank couple you. of last questions. So. so uh, I'm Vicky like from yeah. MSF UK, and I think the question is to the non-MSF people on the panel, including you, John, because it's a follow-up on what you just said. Um, so there is a very large number of samples, Ebola samples, that are spread around the world, <laughs> held in a <laughs> significant number of hands. Mm. So does that represent an opportunity for us to continue with research and development um, in order to prepare for the na next time? And if so, what is the best... What is the best way to manage that uh, multiplicity, if you like, of, of I'm gonna opportunity? That, I'm going to hand that to Vasi, because yeah, I think sure. that's a potential role for WHO there. Well, as, as it happens, there is, I know, you know, a meeting is never a solution to anything, um, but a, what we need are ways forward with um, sample sharing. And it, this, is, this is a really critical question. There, it, as it happens, there is a, me a major consultation on this on Wednesday next week in Geneva. We have uh, a couple of days before that, we have a, a big group of the leaders um, globally who are coming to, to um, begin, move forward with the, the whole, laying out the blueprint for all of these kinds of activities. So this is one of those. And the other, there are many others. How do we better share the epidemiological data? How do we, next time this happens, how do we better get all of the information out there about the natural history of, of disease when a new pathogen is emerging, the case reports, the clinical trials of preventive therapies, diagnostics, and the sample sharing. But all of these are really big, very important, actually, strategic issues. And 
we, you know, we're taking this on. I mean, from our side, what we can do is come together and develop norms and standards for sort of expedited working in these areas. I mean, it's, it's not OK, in my view, for people to be holding on to things, uh, information, be it information or samples, ultimately, you know, against the public health needs. So, so we need to find a way, incentives and safeguards to, to enable people to do that. I and mean, one of the other issues that I think sort of goes across all of this is how do we get information out there? I mean, so we, I, I don't know if anybody saw it, but WHO launched our public position on aggregate results sharing. This is not in emergencies, but this is the general position on public disclo disclosure of results from all interventional clinical trials. This came out in PLOS Medicine um, just a few weeks ago. And essentially, this is in line with the timelines, timeframes for, for results reporting that are emerging in, in the EU and, and the US FDA, and, and just highlighting there's a big problem in general with um, publication bias and dissemination bias, which is not new, but just this is something that we can actually fix. Funders can ensure that if they fund a clinical trial, that the results become available at some point. There's a lot of dis discussions about participant level data sharing. There's actually a step before that, just ensuring that all studies which occur are reported at some point. And if anybody is interested, you know, I could send you the list of all of the, the citations that confirm that this itself is a big problem outside of emergencies. There was a public um, publication in the New England Journal of Medicine recently that showed that even those, those trials that are legally required to be reported in the USA, only a very small fraction of those that are legally reported comply with a time frame. So even legislation is not enough if it's not enforced. I think funders could have a big role here. But those time frames outside of emergencies are way too long, even if you met those. And we're talking about 12 months from the primary completion date. And in, in my experience working in this emergency, that there are examples of good practice with people sharing information. I mean, obviously, you have to have the information because the outcome of that can, lead, is, can be actionable for responses for public health programs, etc. So we, I think that is a big ticket item that we need to improve expedited sharing. And, and it, it's but on it, the I mean, One of the things is, is, is WHO strong enough to ensure that this happens? And is, is WHO going to be, at the end of this outbreak, stronger than it, or weaker than it was before? Well, I mean, that's a, that's, a big, that, 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 that's a big question. I mean, essentially, as you know, WHO, we're not, the, we're not a police force. We're, we are the UN public health agency. So this depends on the community coming together and coming to agreement on that. And, and we are catalyzing that. In some areas, people come together and take, you know, really effective action. And there are, you can go to the extreme, like the framework conventions in tobacco control, where all of the countries decide they want to sign up to legal measures. That's where people want to go at, at the end of what you can do. Before that, if we all come together and, and come to agreement on how we can take this forward, then yes, I think we can make major progress in, in the next few months. Michaela, quickly. And yes, then final question from the lady in the back. And then coming back to the original question of Jay, um, I, I think that, yes, we can shorten a little bit the, the research time or the time that we, uh, we spend in research. And there are two main aspects. I think that preclinical data, we had a pipeline for Ebola, and there was no preclinical data. So that could be advanced. We had vaccines. There was no phase one. So we cannot, in the middle of the outbreak, decide to do a phase one. We should have done that before. So I think there are two aspects that we can do for the next outbreaks to be sure that whenever the outbreak comes, we are at the right time for the right trial. Yeah, very good point. Last question. So um, I, it, now with the, with the decrease in the media attention or in, in the attention overall to, to Ebola in, in, the, in a few of the past meetings, there's there's kind of a, a trend where history is starting to be rewritten and in a, in quite a dangerous way so i'm asking i know msf is uh, i know we're, we're doing evaluations and different evaluations of the, what the response was to ebola what the history actually was what we could have done better uh, what we need to do for next time i'm just wondering if the other agencies are doing the same thing if they're planning to do the same thing and to do a, a critical analysis of the response so that next time the response can actually be a better one. I think that's an easy answer. Uh, yes, there's an epidemic of that going on now. So um, so I think I think with that, I think we're going to have to finish there, unfortunately. We've, it's been a fascinating discussion. I uh, thank the panelists for participating. And not all of the questions were terribly easy to answer, but, uh, but thanks again. Thank you.